Welcome, everyone. I am Justin Paperni with White Collar Advice. So grateful you're here, whether on our podcast or watching on YouTube. Today's a, a good day for our company, in part because it brings attention to mass incarceration, ways in which people can prepare properly for sentencing, hold a lawyer accountable, be productive in prison. And the way that we're conveying this message today is by way of a, a very lengthy article that the New York Times ran along with the New York Times magazine. I'm going to read the article and offer insights uh, along the way, similar to what I've done with other blogs or video blogs. So this is going to be a, a longer video. I hope you're engaged. And while you're here, please subscribe to the podcast or YouTube channel. For some background, Jack Hitt, a journalist with the Times, reached out to me in April of 2021 and reached out after watching some of our YouTube videos and specifically the 90-minute podcast slash video interview I did with Dr. Phil, and he was intrigued in ways that uh, people can mitigate outside of what a lawyer is retained to do. And he was fascinated by something I said, specifically the, the, the biggest or highest value in a minimum security camp isn't you know violence. There are those that will prey upon the vulnerabilities of others. And I tried to articulate, our team tries to articulate the highest value in many of these minimum security camps our boredom. Of course, there is violence in prison. My business partner, Michael Santos, my mentor, served 26 consecutive years in prison, including eight years in the penitentiary, where there was violence walking through puddles of, of blood. Thankfully, the lion's share of people who work with white collar advice will endure time in a minimum security camp. And while there are fights, if you act like a fool at a, in a coffee shop, you're going to get beat up, I suppose. If you act like a fool in prison, there will be issues. Generally speaking, the highest value is freedom. And in we want to help ensure that people's prison terms are productive and does not amount to a life sentence. So based on this conversation, Jack Kidd wanted to write a very lengthy article, but not just what I'm telling him. He wanted to speak with clients. So that was Hugo Mejia, Stanley Benton, the rapper known as Stat Quo, following their journey, attending sentencing hearings. And that's documented in this article with the title, Want to Do Less Time? A Prison Consultant Might Be Able to Help. For a price, a new breed of fixers teaching convicts how to reduce their sentence, get placed in a better facility, and make the most of their months behind bars. So let's transition again. Thank you for your interest as we go through this lengthy article. Hugo Mejia remembers when his Xanax habit ran off the rails. It was around when his small-time Bitcoin cash exchange business blew up, and he was handling millions of dollars, and the whole thing turned into what federal prosecutors called a money laundering operation. It all started so innocently. Back when Bitcoin was new, there were people who wanted to flip Bitcoin for dollars and others who needed dollars for Bitcoin. In these early days of cryptocurrency, going from dollars to Bitcoin or vice versa wasn't as easy as it is now. But Mejia figured out how to make it simple enough. He became a human ATM, balancing a trade of Bitcoin with a trade of dollars and charging a little VIG each, each way. I'd make 150 bucks for the day, he said, and that was my day. That was my hustle. Word got around and Mejia got new customers, some of whom wanted to change quite a bit more money than he was accustomed to. Now, I'm not a stupid person, he told me. I knew these individuals were involved, weren't involved in the horse and concession trade like they said. This was getting out of control and I was in too deep. He was putting 2,000 miles a week on his car, picking up suitcases filled with as much as 150,000, even 250,000 in cash, which he would have to take home until he could work on uh, the Bitcoin flip. He asked me, so if you had that kind of money, Jack, for example, if I may, under your bed, could you sleep comfortably? Really? Suddenly he was demanding a lot more from his Xanax. It went from nervousness and stress to fear and depression, he said, all of which found creative ways to express itself. One day he woke up to find his eyes were bleeding from the inside. Mejia was diagnosed with reto retonpathy, good, forgive me for saying that incorrectly, I've only said it a hundred times, and began getting regular injections into his eyeballs to save his sight. Quickly to this point here, he was demanding more from Xanax. That Most people who begin to do wrong know that it's wrong. Many don't stop, but it begins to really get on their conscience. So they may drink, they may eat, they may put on weight, they may do drugs. It was begin to weigh him down and cost him in many areas of his life when he knew he was beginning to, to really engage in shady in criminal transactions for that reason to manage and deal with the stress and the money and the 2000 miles a week on his car 
he began to overuse uh, the Xanax, which further clouded, his, not an excuse, but it further clouded his judgment. Then one very early morning, we continue last winter, it all fell apart. Some 25 federal agents from a joint Homeland Security and IRS task force stormed his house in Ontario, California. They pounced on my home like I was El Chapo, he said. His aunt and mother were handcuffed and Mejia was detained in his den by agents who grilled him for hours. Not uncommon, even if you've been working for years and they've been investigating you for years, they, they love the, the song and dance of the 6 a.m. with the machine guns and the helicopters and they're very costly uh, to, to taxpayers to come and get you at 6 a.m. But it's something they like to do to make an example out of people. Not only did they pounce and arrest him, as Jack Hitt wrote in this article, his aunt and mother were handcuffed and Mejia was detained in his den by agents who grilled him for hours. Mejia, a U.S. Army veteran and former school teacher, insists he had never messed up like this before. He always thought of himself as a hardworking, regular guy. Mejia is good looking in a middle aged Vin Diesel sort of way. He certainly didn't recognize himself in the Department of Justice news release that was issued shortly after his arrest, painting him as an international financial mastermind facing as much as 25 years in federal prison. For all of you reading or listening to this, to be clear, I know many of you do not agree with your Department of Justice press releases. Hugo did not. I didn't agree with mine. All of you have to remember, if you're a defendant, civil or criminal, they have an objective, meaning they, the government, you've got to embrace and understand the stakeholders. They have an interest in justice and deterrence and advancing their career, and they are going to write and say things that you may not agree with, but it advances their agenda. And as you will hear in this lengthy article from the New York Times, uh, Hugo began to change the narrative. That's what all of you have to do, whether you work with our company or not. He also couldn't get a straight answer about anything. He hadn't even been formally arrested yet. He was a target in a much bigger investigation. The federal authorities really wanted the identity of a certain guy whose money Mejia handled, but Mejia says he never met this person. He quickly su suggested a proffer, a deal, but the feds wanted to know more about his client. Mejia insisted he didn't know any more and found himself in an impossible situation. If he didn't tell them something, he was facing serious time. I don't know if Hugo had interest in cooperating. I suppose they gave him an opportunity, but it was nothing for him to consider because he had no one to cooperate against. He didn't know he didn't know this this person. And that's just that was frustrating to them. And part of the reason um, they were angry because they want cooperators. They want more cases. He just told the truth. I don't have anything to give you. From there, the article continues, of course, he hired a lawyer, one who described himself as a cryptocurrency expert. But soon Mejia discovered that their expensive sessions mostly involved Mejia's tutor and his own attorney in the complexities of the blockchain. He was already going to plead out and sense that he was in the grip of an inescapable process. So he fired that lawyer and the next one and wound up being represented by a court appointed attorney. When I had my first call with Hugo, he scheduled a call with our team. He was frustrated because some lawyers had marketing on their website that said they know cryptocurrency, they know the intricacies of it, they know the nuances of it. And it's what our team frequently says, a white collar advisor, prison professors, in our podcasts, in our books, everywhere. Just because someone says they can help you doesn't mean they can. Just because they can write copy on a website doesn't mean they can. A huge value to this article for our company isn't me telling the judge or me telling the journalist. It's in my interest to say it. You're going to hear you're going to hear in a moment in this article what a federal judge told our client at sentencing, why they departed. It's in the transcripts that the Times got and the 50 hour fact check our team did with them. That's the power of it, whether we help you or not, the power of telling the story. But never forget for all of you, just because someone says they can help you doesn't mean they can. And just because it's on their website that they're an expert in crypto or money laundering or going to trial doesn't mean that they've had success there. And Hugo was contemplating hiring yet another lawyer who said, I know cryptocurrency. I don't know the nuances of it. And Hugo said, I've been burned once and twice. The third time I'm going to be a fool. I ain't doing it. I'm going to go with the court appointed lawyer and mitigate and learn from Hugo. In the meantime, he started scouring the internet madly to see what he can learn about his future. I would scare myself watching videos of jail, he said. Mejia had entered one of the kubler Roshan periods of the prison-bound self-terrorism. But then Mejia stumbled on a video of a guy named Justin Paperni. Hey, that's me. Himself a former financial criminal. I'm, I'm always going to be known as a criminal who was all over YouTube dispensing, so you're going to prison. I actually don't think I filmed the video, so you're going to prison, but I should. Good title. Thanks, New York Times. Advice in a confident, peppy patter. Answering questions newly charged defendants might not even think to ask. Mejia loved this guy and spent hours watching his videos. It would kind of calm my anxiety, he said. The big fear started to seem less terrifying. He learned that he would most likely be going to a low-security prison where violence is not even common, 
let alone rape or anything like that. So on my first call with Hugo, it goes how a lot of calls go with our team. Someone's just pled guilty or they've been indicted. They haven't even sat for the probation report and been sentenced. And it's normal to be obsessed with prison. Like, what is prison like? What are the showers, the jobs, the toilets? How do I get in? How do I get out? How does my family visit? What's commissary like? Are there all things that are very natural? And what our team did was say, Hugo, I know those things are important to you. And if God forbid you go to prison, we're going to prepare you. What we need to focus on right now is like, what's the next right thing to do? Do you agree with your Department of Justice press release? No. Why? They think of some career international mastermind of crypto. I don't think the government fully understands crypto because it's so new and nuanced. And they assume anyone involved in crypto is a criminal. I got to change that narrative. Then let's start there before we worry about how good the food is in the commissary. He's like, I'm all in. From there, he contemplated hiring a lawyer. I said, do you qualify for a court-appointed lawyer? He said, yes. I said, let's learn to hold that lawyer accountable. And you're going to hear about that lawyer in this video. He so said, good, let's do that. Let's begin to change the narrative. Justin Paperni leads White Collar Advice, a firm of 12 convicted felons, each with their own consulting specialty based on where they serve time and their own sentencing experiences. After a deep dive into Paperni's YouTube lessons, Mejia knew he had to hire him, hire us. Our team does this work, not just me, we're a team. This was a 21st century America, and this was precisely what he needed, a prison consultant. If I would make one change to this article, prison consultant at times can be a degrading term because anyone can go to prison for six months or a year, come home, create a YouTube channel, and fancy themselves a consultant. And I like to think our team is involved in mitigation and strategies that are well beyond what life is like in prison. And as you'll hear in this article, it's about mitigation, demonstrating through your own words why you're worthy of leniency, what you've learned, why you'll never return. And again, we get into the, sp the sp specifics of that um, in this, this article. So I understand the term prison consultant is good in the media. It brings some attention, but we're mitigators. We're in the crisis management space. We're dealing with people who want to jump off a bridge who can't envision some future without heartache and pain. And while prison consultant is at times something we embrace, we're in the crisis management space. I don't want to make that clear. Maybe you've heard of these consultants recently. After a prominent felon is sentenced, a spate of stories often appear about these backstage fixers for the wealthy consultants who can help get a client into prisons that one might prefer. Say a prison that has superior schooling or CrossFit level gyms or lenient furlough policies or better paying jobs or other refined specialties. The federal prison in Otisville, New York, for example, is also known as federal Jewish heaven. I didn't give them that quote. Because of its good kosher food, decent kefelta fish, they say, and the rugula's not bad. As a Jew, I've never eaten kefelta fish. I never will. When those varsity blues parents were busted for paying backdoor operatives to engineer their kids' college admissions, it was also reported that many hired prison consultants to game out the aftermath. As many of you know, we worked with uh, 10 families or so in the Varsity Blues case, and we could have had them inserted into this article, but I'm glad we didn't because we're focused on Hugo and Stanley in this. But the Times did confirm when we mentioned that we work with them, they did confirm who we worked with. Uh, they just chose not to be included in uh, in the article. I think that was a, that was a good decision because it could have been fixated and focused on our celebrity rich clients rather than uh, the heart of the article, which is Hugo and stat quo, we'll get into in a moment. Paperni's business is a natural market outgrowth of a continuing and profound shift in America's judicial system. Almost everyone facing charges is forced to plead guilty or face an angry prosecutor who will take you to trial. In 2021, 98.3% of federal cases ended up as plea bargains. It's arguable arguable that in our era of procedural dramas and endless law and order reruns, speedy and public trials are more common on television than in real life courthouses. What people like me here have, have to deal with as they await sentencing is a lot of logistics. After this article came out, you know, these things attract a lot of attention from a number of people, of people who reach out to say, great article, congratulations, this is so great for your company. A lot of jealousy out there, haters, people call me. Uh, how you only served a year in prison, you weren't in a Bureau of Prisons, you know, f facility. And, you know, I, I can't believe you only served a year and this isn't fair and you didn't really struggle and you went to a club fed and you should have gone to a real prison. But you got raped and beat up and kidnapped and extorted. And it's like it's like kind of pushing people down rather than just saying congratulations. People calling me, I don't know, you know, jealousy. It does no good to engage in dialogue like, well, my business partner, Michael Santos, served 26 years in prison, penitentiary, medium, the high to the low, 27 prisons, the transit, Sam Mangel prison, Larry Hartman. Brad Rouse, our whole team served time in all scores of all types of prisons all throughout the country. I don't want to engage in that. It's a waste of time. It's bringing people are jealous and it's unfortunate. I would communicate to everyone who is going to prison who to 
to the extent that you can be positive and outline a plan like I began to outline with Michael back in 2008 in federal prison, uh, just get started. So the line share of the, the comments and the people reaching out are favorable and it's fantastic, but there are a lot of haters out there and that's, um, that's just unfortunate. It's a waste of their time, but we're going to keep moving on and let's get back to uh, Let's get back to this article. Oh, one other thing. I did receive a call from a just retired prosecutor who went into private practice who was somewhat offended by this line in here. I had to remind him you're now a defense attorney, but he said, or face an angry prosecutor who will take you to trial. He gave the impression he's the most honest, honest, ethical prosecutor that ever existed, and he would never force someone to go to trial, nor would he overreach. Okay, 98.3% of people plead guilty. Do you think some of those are innocent? Uh, that's a big yes. It's because the trial tax is too significant, too big. Continuing in the article, the idea of a prison consultant might conjure an image of an inside insider broker or fixer, but they are really more like an SAT tutor, someone who understands test logic and the nuances of unwritten rules. Yet prison consulting also involves dealing with a desolate human being who has lost everything, friends, family, money, reputation, and done it in such a way that no one gives a damn. So they're also a paid for best friend, plying their clients with Tony Robbins style motivational insights, occasionally mixed with powerful sessions about the nature of guilt and shame. When I mentioned with very, no one really cares, there's an otherness to white collar crime. It's not like cancer. You know, nobody chooses to get cancer. Of course, you're going to have sympathy for someone. With white collar crime, people reason, we brought this on ourselves for that reason. We are not worthy of, of leniency. There's an otherness that accompanies white collar crime. I know since I've been a criminal since February 25th, 2008. On television, the journey to prison is nearly instantaneous, a jump cut to slamming a cell door. But in the real world, it's a set of steps, routine bureaucratic actions that involve in interviews, numerous forms to complete and dates with officials. A lawyer is your legal guide to staying out of prison, but once that becomes inevitable, a prison consultant is there to chaperone you through the bureaucracies that will eventually land you in your new home, easing your entry into incarceration, and sometimes returning you to the outside utterly changed. I want you if you're going to prison and you broke the law and you're suffering. And if you've created victims, I want you to come home like Hugo will utterly change in a more, in a hell, I want you to be healthy. I want you to be strong. And you can only do that if you have a plan on the inside, which we will get into in this video when it describes my meeting, my partner, Michael Santos. When I first started talking to Mejia and sitting in on his consultations about a year ago, there was rarely a meeting when he wouldn't slip in some version of the story of his crime. Mostly, he tried to emphasize that he wasn't as guilty as his plea made him out to be, that he wasn't really deep down a criminal at all. He would tell it over and over again. It would pop up in almost any, in all, in almost any conversation, often wedged into a conversation after a, for the record, or I just want to say, or Jack, you might be interested to know. So this is often a problem with people that plead guilty and something Brad, uh, Sam, Michael, and me, Larry, spent a lot of time helping you understand, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to make a choice. You can't say you're guilty, but you're kind of not guilty. That's going to be off-putting to a judge. His guidelines were 57 to 71 months. I am convinced had he continued to go down that path, of kind of justifying, excusing, I'm not really a criminal, these aren't really the facts. There's no question he'd have gotten a guideline sentence. It required him to look within and at times may say some things like, I'm sorry and ashamed that he didn't yet feel, but in time he did. And it took him some time because it takes people time to understand how they broke the law, what they learned from it, why they did it, what compelled them to cross the line. It is an iterative process that takes thousands of hours and it's going to take decades. It, it, I'm still working on telling my story in a way that's believable and realistic, most importantly, doesn't offer any excuse or justification. It is a process that any convicted felon, presuming they want to try, and try to change the narrative, should work until the day they die. The tone of, uh, and desperation of that repeated story, I was in over my head, I'm not a bad guy, always had a kind of curdling effect on the listener. It was tiresome, but also on some level it felt familiar. In much less calamitous circumstances, we've all vamped our way through some variation of it. It's every culprit's first draft of his own story because it's human nature. It's irresistible. In the Shawshank Redemption, when Tim Robbins first insists that he did nothing wrong, Morgan Freeman beams, hell, you'll fight, you'll fit right in then, he says. Everyone's innocent in here. One of the first thing Paperni advises a client like Mejia to do is stop doing that, especially before sentencing. You pleaded guilty already. You did it. Own it because the vamping will almost certainly annoy any judge or civil servant who hears it, and you'll wind up with a much longer sentence. That's arguably the most crucial piece of advice that Perni, per Perni and our team provides to his clients for the simple reason that when you're going to prison, you have to formally tell your story to all sorts of people. 
So as you create your story, look, if you can create your story on you or on your own, you should. It can't be, be boilerplate. It can't be insert an answer to a question and someone's going to write it. That, that is utterly absurd. That is kindergarten type work. You need to be interviewed for hours. We need to write. We need to edit. We need to th rip it apart, throw it on the wall, start over. I mean, it is 20 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours. And the narrative, it's not just something that you'll use for a probation officer or a sentencing judge. You'll give it to a case manager in prison. You'll give it to a probation officer to get higher levels of liberty upon release. When he wrote here, you have to formally tell your story to all kinds of people. You got that right. It's just not the stakeholders in the system. It's your family. It's a potential employer. It's a funder. It's a business partner. It's a potential spouse. It's a child. You've got to tell your story at the right time and be able to convey it in a way that is frankly uh, believable, which is why our team, you know, the consulting is valuable, I suppose, but it's a little amorphous, a little tough to define at times, not in the production of content. It's either best in class or it isn't. If you're not gonna have best in class and do it the right way, don't turn anything in because it could work against you if a judge finds it off putting or has the wrong message. If you were to ever speak with my uh, partner, Michael Santos, he would say, it's all about the message. What is your message for these stakeholders? If it's wrong or it's off or you're unsure, get help from someone um, because this is too precious. We're talking about freedom and you know months out of months out of federal prison. This is your life. The storytelling officially begins a few weeks after a guilty plea or a conviction by trial in a sit down interview with a law enforcement officer whose specialty is writing up a pre-sentencing report, which will be given to the presiding judge. The descriptions of the crime. It's terrible cold coffee. The descriptions of the crime come largely from the plea agreement, which is naturally centered on the proposition that you are a heinous criminal and a moral fugitive. Think of a Wikipedia biography that tells the story of the worst moment of your life with everything else you salted away in footnotes. This is what the sentencing judge will read before deciding precisely how long you will be confined. And it's a story that will follow, follow you throughout your stay with the state. They call the pre-sentencing report the Bible in prison because it is one of the first things a case manager or counselor will rely upon, Perperny said. It will influence early release, your half, halfway house time, your bunk, your job, and so on. And the person writing the story for you is someone who's already heard every version of the breathy, steam, uh, stem-winding explanation imaginable. They're used to us saying, we're sorry because we got caught, Perperny said during one of his meetings with Mejia, or we paid back the money because we don't want to go to jail, or we cooperated to avoid prison. So it'd be wise for all of you who have a probation interview to recognize that in advance of that interview, the probation officer will review the plea agreement, probably Google you to see the horrific press releases, anything else that's out there, and speak with the prosecutor to get their version of events. So if you're not looking to influence that person uh, positively, given all that they have, um, get it together, man. Okay. Many lawyers send their clients into this interview with the standard legal advice to say as little as possible and limit the damage. Good advice during arrest or even in the courtroom. But in this most important interview, the defendant will ever have, you'd be stunned at how many defendants do not prepare. This is a chance for you to change the narrative. At that moment, Mejia says hello to the interviewer. All the material the officer has on the table is focused on the crime. And if Mejia, Mejia surrenders to the mighty tug of self-exoneration, then the focus of the story remains the legal transgression and the biography instantly turns into a profile of a career criminal. All of you should show up to your probation interview with your personal narrative that articulates in your own words what you've learned, where you're going, why you'll never return. If there are victims that you identify with them, what your plans are moving forward, you should get this narrative copy and pasted into the actual pre-sentence report, which is what we were able to do. Uh, with, with Hugo. Typically, our team will spend hours preparing someone for a probation interview. If your lawyer says, I just show up and answer some questions, much ado about nothing, uh, you are in trouble, my friend. Let's continue. Instead, Paperini and his colleagues coach a full biography out of each client. Coax a full biography out of each client. They encourage you to write out a full story in the form of a letter, then rewrite it with editors working through every line, then ask you to read it over and over until eventually you sit down for a mock interview. By the time the officer is conducting the real interview, the story he hears is a full autobiography with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And somewhere in there is this speed bump in the narrative, your crime. During these early sessions, a client will often spend time with Brad Rouse, who is the firm's expert in written narrative. In his previous career, Rouse is a well-known theater director in New York, a Harvard graduate whose credits include the 2012 musical about Andy Warhol, Pop, and Billy Porter's 2005 one-man show, Ghetto Superstar.
His 2001 revival of the Har Harold Arlen musical Bloomer Girl earned him a segment on CBS's 60 Minutes 2. But those aren't his real credentials. Like everyone else on Paperni's consulting team, Rouse has served time in federal lockup. About 15 years ago, he fell heavily into drug use and ended up dealing five, six, seven types of drugs until some agents burst into his West Village apartment. Often when clients first encounter Rouse, they are in that post-plea misery marked by social paralysis, thousand-yard stares in near catatonia. It's a delicate time. Suicide is a real risk. I remember when I piled furniture up in front of my window because I'm on the sixth floor, he said. I had such a desire to kill myself. Many of the people he talks to have basically been law-abiding high achievers who justified crossing some line for the first time, lost everything, and were starting staring into a near future of incarceration. They feel like they dropped through the dance floor and it's over, he told me. That's where the conversation often starts. Scatter details eventually gathered into coherence. It's like directing a one-man show, he said, except the audience is also one person, the judge. Throughout the spring, Mejia was kicking drafts of the letter back and forth with Rouse and Paperni, and I read them as they bounced more as they became more and more refined. Mejia's pre-sentencing interview was scheduled in June, and by early summer, a different character began to come into focus. A 15-year-old striver who rode a bus for an hour to work as a liquor store stock boy and who once won a competition with his King Lear monologue, who then left home to become a recognizance specialist in the Army before returning to Los Angeles for college and eventually a master's in business administration. Mejia's story, which is about half as long as this article, has a Hallmark TV movie quality to it, but the result is intriguing, almost like one of those standout obituaries, only the subject is alive. This was a really important part of our work on the narrative because there's a number of uh, lawyers, not all, who will say the narrative is too long. I mean, we've had narratives that are 10, 15, 20 pages. We've had clients turn in books in a sentencing hearing. But a lot of lawyers will say it's too long and you're including superfluous information, like when you began working. You know, one uh, lawyer in Ohio years ago said, the judge don't care that our guy was delivering milk with his dad at nine. And the irony was the judge commented how much he appreciated our client's work ethic by having to work at nine with his father. So Hugo, to his credit, used his judgment. Hugo, to his credit, recognized, you know, at 15, I wasn't playing AYSO, I wasn't playing Little League, or I wasn't playing sports in high school. I had to work and I had to drive and I had to make money to help sustain my family. That speaks to discipline and work ethic and character. And I think it's a mitigating factor. So as you're assessing what to include, if you're getting advice that things should not be included, use your own judgment and learn from this. Because the story began to change when we portrayed him not as a cryptocurrency launderer, but rather someone who made bad decisions, but throughout his life, he's worked hard, he's done the right thing, he's educated, he wants to do better, he's a veteran. Look at him differently. Look at this small decision in the totality of his life and judge him from that perspective. We were able to do that by way of the narrative. But if you get con conflicting advice, learn from this and use your own judgment and ask questions. Why is it not a value for a judge to recognize how, when I began working? Because that federal judge, too, probably began working at a young age. Because to become a federal judge, you have incredible work ethic and discipline. A judge may appreciate it. We think you got to decide what's best for you. One expected feature of these narratives is how much of the story hints at a rehabilitation that has yet to fully manifest. Of course, that's part of the forward vision. Who do you want to become? Lay it out there. More than a few felons awaiting sentencing told me, and Jack spoke with many people on our team, many clients, I should say, not only two are in this article, but he spoke with eight or nine and kind of got their opinions. And it was tough. Jack attended the sentencing hearing. It was tough with COVID to have him attend a sentencing hearing because so many where he lives back east were kicked three months, six months. We were working on this story with another client. Sentencing got delayed for a year because of COVID. So it was hard to find a client willing to go through all this process and ensuring the story wouldn't take 10 years or 15 years with COVID. We didn't know when someone was going to get uh, sentenced. More than a few felons awaiting sentencing told me that they were already paying back their victims. Many just get jobs. One former CEO I spoke with was working for minimum wage. That's a great story. He's a client of ours making a million bucks a year and he's working for minimum wage and he loved it and he was working and giving back and volunteering. The judge really appreciated it. Imagine that a million bucks a year to minimum wage and doing it with pride, with dignity. That's a great story. I got. I should do that video. It's a great story. Many just get jobs. One former CEO I spoke with is working for minimum wage. 
while others have started businesses and kept them operating straight through a lengthy prison term. Part of the reason Paperni pushes his clients to get back to work, any work, is to provide some good, upright citizen material for the pre-sentence report, but also to break out of the paralysis that Rouse describes. After Paperni got caught, he remembers letting whole days and weeks go by, ordering two double cheeseburgers, two fries and a shake from In-N-Out while compulsively playing online chess until the one-time trim USC college baseball player staggered around his house topping 200 pounds. It was more like 215. If you've listened to a podcast, maybe you've heard an ad for Me Undies. The company was started by a man named Jonathan Shokrian just before he was sentenced to a short prison term in 2014. He hired Paperni on his way in and ran the company from prison later expanding it after meeting a bank robber named Greece, who it turns out was a marketing savant. So by the time he was prepping for his pre-sentencing interview, he had already set up several new enterprises, one of them an online store that sells Rolexes, which can be paid for with crypto. Watch huddler.com. But how the letter handles the present tense is the most vivid transformation. All the self-exoneration has been slyly edited out. The first person confessional tone is searing. I write this letter feeling humiliated and heartbroken, Mihia begins. I now, I now know that I crossed a red line that exists for important reasons. At first, exchanging cash for Bitcoin seemed legitimate. I see now that I was wrong. He closes by addressing the judge directly. It was important for me to show you who I really am. I accept a full responsibility for my action and will never return to your courtroom as a criminal defendant. That last line, by the way, because I've had people say to me like, Anyone can just use that line. I accept full responsibility and will never return. It sounds great, but you can't close with something like that or akin to that unless you've actually laid out the plan that demonstrates why you'll never return to a courtroom as a criminal you know, de defendant. Does, does that make sense? There are people who like kind of try to take this work or pawn it off and just write this like, oh, this I'm going to just write to a judge. I'll never return. He's going to believe it. No, it's every, it's the eight pages prior to that. I'm working, I'm making money. I'm building a new business as a law abiding citizen. I'm working to contribute and give back. I'm saving to pay back, you know, my victims or any restitution that I owe. I'm compliant on pretrial. I'm contributing to my community, generating character reference letters that speak to his character. So like, you can't just take this, you can write it, but unless it's backed up with evidence, it's just, it's boilerplate. It's, 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 it's BS. It's, it's utter nonsense. Everything that came before this gave Hugo the right, the right to say, I will never return to your courtroom as a criminal defendant because he laid out the path. He laid out the plan. Hey, there's my man, my man Hugo right now. He's currently in prison at Sheridan uh, doing great. That to do. Save that for a later video. That's Hugo during the New York Times photo shoot at his home in Ontario. The tenor here feels pious as though somehow the whole process has reverted to the religious origins of incarceration. Guilt, confession, penitence, this legal vocabulary of criminal justice calls back to a time when confinement was about reform and salvation. Before modern punishment turned exclusively on physical torture, the amateur savagery of shower rape jokes, random beatdowns, the cruelty of solitary. But all the parts together and the buoyant takeaway for any judge reading it is that maybe his job is already done. Nothing isolates one's crime and all the moral dereliction that comes with it, quite like a story in which the jail time, which hasn't even started, already seems to be receding in the past. When the rapper Stat Quo, Stat, he's the greatest, one of the business best business mentors I've ever had. Uh, we meet regularly. He's next to Michael Santos, the best business mentor and best business mind I've ever met. I will, whenever I text him, I will say, I have learned a hundred times more than you ever learned from me. I'm so grateful to know you. And by the way, if you ever have lunch with StatQuo, if you pull out your credit card, you're in trouble. He will, he will never let me pay for anything, regardless, regardless of where we go. One of the greatest and best minds I've met in my entire life. I'm so privileged to work with people like Stanley. And I'm so for our team, whole team is so fortunate. He's the greatest. What a mentor to me. When the rapper Stat Quo was busted on charges of participating in a scheme to steal millions of frequent flyer miles. Naturally, he hired a lawyer, but he was still freaking out. So I went on YouTube and I was just looking up, you know, what do you do when you have been named in an indictment? I should film that video too. Stat quo legally Stan Stanley Benton came across the same videos Mejia found and started in his words, binge watching. Every topic that was haunting him, what to do when you're actually indicted, picking a lawyer, preparing a sentencing memorandum, each had its own video narrated with Paperni's trademark confidence. 
Okay, stat quote remembers thinking, this guy know what he's knows what he's talking about, so he hired him. On the morning I caught up with Stat Quo, he had just gotten back from a Pasadena kitchen where he was cooking breakfast for the homeless three mornings a week. He started doing it years ago, long before he got into trouble and stayed with it. Actually, it's important for, him, for me to see that, you know what I mean? Because you know this Hollywood stuff that I'm in, you will lose sight of reality sometimes, you know? My friend's houses look like malls. I have seen some of his friends. I know some of his friends. Their houses are like malls or islands. Wow. His full story was pitch perfect. He'd never tangled with the law before, and he has a family. Still, he had the usual long-winded take of his own innocence. His friend had offered him discount airline tickets, and he bought them without knowing that his friend had gotten them by hacking into other people's accounts and stealing their miles. But, but when Stat Quo sat down to work on his narrative, he totally got it. He knew that anyone walking into a pre-sentence interview is presumed to be a hardened criminal. But a black rapper? My case was out of Dallas, Texas, and let's be honest here, he said not the most progressive state for a black man. And listen, I'm not Drake black. <laughs> I'm like Shaka Zulu black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Three of the other defendants who used stolen miles got real time. One guy got up there trying to explain all kinds of expletive and making excuses. That's the wrong thing to do. But he didn't have anyone to tell him because that's just your natural instinct when you get in front of somebody. Judge, wait a minute, man. I ain't do nothing. Come on, hold on, man. You know, I'm just out here slam. The guy was sentenced to two and a half years. My judge saw me differently, he said. She's like, based on what I've read about you, you shouldn't even be here. In the sentencing hearing, Judge Jane Boyle said aloud, I wonder if he should have even been prosecuted. By the way, the Times got the transcript from Stan sentencing. This is directly from the judge. I'd like to give you six months probation, but I can't. Then she turned to a court officer for clarification. Do I have to give him, she asked, a year probation? Informed that the guidelines required at least one year probation, she imposed exactly that. That's because she was able to read my story, he said. I'm grateful that immediately after his sentencing in Dallas, after calling his family, he called uh, Sam, Brad, and me and said, you guys kept me out of prison, and I'm so grateful, and we're family for the rest of our life. I want you to know that. Much of Paperni's advice comes from his own attempts to avoid prison when the Ponzi scheme he enabled collapsed. After being nabbed, he figured he would outsmart the feds with a series of artful dodges and deceptions. In the midst of constructing this web of lies, Paperni insisted that he take a lie detector test. I, I immediately Googled for information on polygraph examinations, Paperni writes in his self-published Confessional Lessons from Prison. He found a $350 online course which taught him all the ostensibly proven techniques to evade, evade the lie detector. By tightening my sphincter when answering questions, he wrote, I supposedly could mani manipulate the machine's findings of truth to suit my purpose. And yet, even though he practiced so fervently, I get flashback to prison right now, working alongside Michael Santos, writing this part of the book. <laughs> And, he, and yet, even though he practiced so fervently and then squeezed my innards when appropriate, the polygraph administrator informed him afterward that the machine indicated with an accuracy measurement to better than 99.99% that he was lying. Justin, he added, you're going to prison. Once that reality set in, Paperni prepared the same way everyone does and how his clients still do, Googling what happens when you go to prison. That video I filmed. He learned a jubilee of information, but then the day came. Paperni reported to the Taft Federal Prison Camp in California, changing his street clothes for a prison outfit. He quickly discovered that there are lots of rules in prison that Cora doesn't have the answers to in routines you have to discover by yourself. Soon enough, he met people and was told about people. There was a guy known as Dopey, another as Roadrunner. He used to yell five minutes. Nobody knew why he was nobody knew why he was yelling five minutes. He heard about a mysterious figure named the Kingpin who had served the longest and hardest time. And then there was Drew, the hustler on his floor who lured Paperni into accepting a contraband mattress, a dangerous first step because getting caught by the guards doing anything shady can easily win you an extended sentence. It was all dizzying, so Paperni decided to lie, lie low and do what most inmates do, exercise and try to stay out of trouble. After a few days, the kingpin was in the TV room and introduced himself. My name is Michael Santos, and he was busted for dealing in 1987 at the height of President Ronald Reagan's war on drugs. For a first offense at age 23, Santos was sent to federal prison for 45 years. Whatever Paperni might have been expecting, a battle-scarred lifer, a guy who could turn a big pen into a shiv, Santos wasn't it. Instead, he was a self-educated man whose years of reading transformed him into something far beyond your typical jailhouse lawyer. More of a jailhouse philosopher concerned with the metaphysics of confinement.
Our team is a big proponent for avoiding, uh, let's uh, I'll continue on here a little bit. Sanchez wanted to know if Properni had ever read The Define Comedy. In Dante's epic poem, he said, Virgil offered Dante a way out of the forest. Santos encouraged him to not worry so much about the softball league or the card games or all the other time wasters available to prisoners who instinctively believe that their years behind bars are meant to be useless. He encouraged Properni to read Aristotle and to know thyself. He told him he should really read Sun Tzu too and learn to know thy enemy. Like any sane convict, Paperni thought, you're kidding me. I actually remember thinking, you're kidding me, but it took me a few days before I actually said to Michael, you're kidding me. Like any sane convict, Paperni thought, you're kidding me. That's the wisdom of the centuries. Are you serious? Paperni wondered what the point was of all this Reader's Digest philosophy, but he found the books interesting. Who, he wondered, was his enemy? Maybe, Santos told Paperni, the enemy is not a who. Maybe it's a what, he said. Maybe it's a prison term. Maybe it's an unfulfilling career that leads you to misery or to bad decisions that land you in prison. Those quotes, by the way, are taken directly from lessons from prison. At the time, Paperni was dealing with a lot of practical prison problems. He was working in the kitchen under the thumb of an aggressive inmate who trafficked liberally in Holocaust denial. And he sure did. And then there was Santos slowly teaching him to look past the office politics of prison and to try to see his confinement as a bounty, a gift of years to prepare for what comes next. Think of prison as a business planning session, Santos told him. He'd been thinking that way for years. Yeah, since 1987 when Michael went to prison. He had already written several books about getting through prison. Paperni was due to get out a lot earlier than he was, Santos pointed out. So maybe he could get a jump on the obvious business idea, advising incoming felons on how best to handle a future out of prison. When Paperni got out in 2009, he founded the business with Santos joining on his, on his release four years later. Today, Paperni and Santos are business partners, co-founders of White Collar Advice and another business called Prison Professors, which is Santos's attempt to make their services and philosophy available to anyone, not just the white collar felons who can afford their fees. Paperni told me those fees range from a few thousand dollars into the six figures. Santos's intention long before he got out was always much bigger than consulting with white collar criminals, whom he described as merely the consumer, consumer side of the business. As many of you know, prisonprofessors.com is a nonprofit. We have a thousand videos, books, tons of resources we give away for free. A number of people retain us by way of white collar. Some may be able to do it on their own. Prison Professors is a great resource. And White Collar Advice proudly supports the mission of Prison Professors. So a percentage of revenues that come into the for-profit, White Collar Advice helps sustain and grow the nonprofit where Michael really donates the lion's share of his time to grow it uh, without a salary. But those are the kind of the, the different brands that we're running. Michael said, it's way more important to me to help the million people that are in prison who keep recidivating, he said. To that end, the other side of the business seeks to create, recreate for thousands of prisoners a certain encounter Paperni had not long after meeting Santos. When I went in, I was a fat, miserable, self-loathing, white-collar defendant blaming everyone but myself, Paperni said and adjusted to prison like you do, complaining and exercising seven, eight hours a day. Then the Taft prison camp philosopher sidled up to him at the gym one day, and Santos said to me, kind of joking, like, hey, bud, how much are people going to pay you to do those pull-ups when you get out? And I'm like, nobody. And it was an aha moment. Santos believes that inmates should think of confinement not as punishment, but as a continuing education for a future, for a future newly conceived. Our team, Paperni said, is a big proponent for avoiding recreational sports in prison, like softball, because unless you're going to be a softball player when you come home, then I don't think you should play softball four days a week. So every choice should relate to the life you want to live when you come home. When Santos did get out in 2013, he had to get familiar with a few new technologies, email, YouTube, basically the entire internet, but, since, but has since crafted a series of videos into a kind of a freshman course on how to navigate prison. They are now available in all the prisons of Washington State and California, sometimes with the lure of sentence reduction for inmates who complete them. A former warden who knew Santos has helped install them in the parts of the federal prison system. There are courses on setting goals, being accountable, attitude. You're not doing this for a GED certificate or to get a lower bunk pass or an extra bowl of weedy, Santos said, but to attain success as you define it. No matter how energized Santos might get talking about these expanding programs, he's still the jailhouse philosopher, an inmate who can casually sit back at the end of a rift to tell you that he means to upend the entire American penitentiary system through the prisoners themselves, to bend the arc of justice back to its history, 
when confinement was a call not for sadism and misery, but for contrition and deliverance. So the Prison Professors nonprofit that Michael leads creates content that is in prisons and jails across the country. And every California prison implements programs that he creates. And due to Prop 57, which was passed in California, some prisoners that complete the program can get days off of their sentence. So they're developing values and skills and they're saving the state of California. Uh, they're saving taxpayers in California resources that they don't have to pay to warehouse people. But it's not just letting prisoners out early, they're developing skills and they're proving worthy of it. So this nonprofit is a big deal. And in time, I think there's like 3000 counties in America. I suspect within five years, programs that Michael creates and leads will be in a third of those, but I suspect um, we're gonna get hopefully a lot of support uh, for this mission. And we're going to um, we're going to you know continue to work it. But that's the Prison Professors nonprofit. If you'd like to learn more, just send me a message. On the morning of Mejia's sentencing last November, Mejia met up with Paperni outside a coffee shop in Santa Ana. It was on an elegant block shaded by Chinese elm trees and crepe myrtle, with the stunning new Ronald Reagan Federal Building and U.S. Courthouse looming high above. Clerks and bailiffs with their belt badges and ID lanyards stood around drinking coffees. Mejia showed up in a shiny new suit and introduced Paperni to his fiance and his mother. He excitedly told us the day before his lawyer briefed him on some new clever arguments that he would be using to ask for no jail time, just probation and home confinement. Paperni held out an open hand as if to slow things down and reminded Mejia that the state was asking for nearly five years. It would be unusual for a judge to stiff a prosecutor by giving Mejia no time at all. I wouldn't be surprised if you got three years, he said trying to lower expectations. But Perny often finds himself at odds with the lawyers, mostly over details where he's relying on his hard uh, won experience. I just, I don't think it's, I think it's good to manage expectations. You know, when you have a guideline of 57 to 71 months, you can ask for probation, but you're not likely to get it. Plus the chasm may be too big. I mean, do something more measured and, and realistic. So I was always conditioning Hugo to get 57 to 71 months and it would be success if you got 57 months. That's the low end of the range. They're going to add, the government's going to ask for it. Anything less than that is a really good day. And if it goes lower than that, then you've really hit the jackpot. You're really fortunate. Your mitigation was really best in class. And you know, not everyone's going to get the outcome of stat quo of getting you know pro probation when his co-defendants were getting two and a half or three years in prison. I understand that, but I do I do find it valuable to manage expectations because if you're expecting probation, you get two years. You may be disappointed if the guidelines are five years. But if you were expecting five years and you got two, you'd be thrilled. It's really in the mind, but you do have to manage expectations. Um, the expectations game aside, Paperni was very concerned, agitated almost, about some specific advice he had written to Mejia in emails and mentioned numerous Zoom consults. There were a series of steps that had to be taken to secure the best possible outcome. There would be a back and forth between the two lawyers, and then the judge would pronounce a sentence. Right afterward, Mejia had to make sure his lawyer asked two questions. Will the judge recommend a drug rehabilitation program? This can take up to a year off your sentence. And would the judge recommend that Mejia go to the low security camp in Oregon? This is important because there is no camp in California that has the drug program. Too many lawyers will ask for a prison that is closest to the defendant's home, and that prison may not have RDAP. And too many, too many lawyers will ask for several prisons. You really just want to ask for one prison, and you know, odds are the BOPs and so studies show they're going to follow the judicial recommendation, though not always. Inside, Judge Cormac Carney, a federal district court, reviewed the details of the crime and noted that his sentencing guidelines called for 57 to 71 months. Before he invited each side to make arguments about what the actual sentence should be, he spoke expansively about Mejia's army experience, his hardship as a child, his eye disease. Clearly, some version of Mejia's biography had made its way to the judge's bench through the official bureaucratic channels that Paperni taught him to work. I wouldn't say it's teaching him to work. We wrote his narrative, shared details about his life that only Hugo can share. It's this old idea, if you've retained a lawyer, and I hope you retain the best lawyer, and we get referrals from the best lawyers, it doesn't change according to what Judge Boo told us on a YouTube video that lawyers are paid to say why you're worthy of leniency or a specific outcome. They're paid to say it, and I want them to say it well. It's measurably different if they hear it from you, and Hugo, to his credit, did it beautifully. Then the prosecutor, Jason Pang, took the lectern and also admitted he was impressed with Mejia's story, noting that Mejia's plan and expression of remorse were worthy things and that his military service was something that the court needs to consider. He recommended the low end of the sentencing guidelines, which as we know is 57 months. So that, that is a win. 
Mejia's court-appointed lawyer, Michael Crane, stepped up and dialed things all the way back to the case itself. Mejia got busted, he explained, because a confidential informant got him talking about money laundering with crypto. Crane challenged the government's tactics, arguing that the CI, cooperating informant, was probably trying to lower his own sentence and that much of what Mejia had said that implicated him in major felonies was really nothing more than puffery. You could almost feel the air in the room change. The morality play we'd been watching all along had become a courtroom drama. He went on to pull from that week's headlines, pointing out that the day before the QAnon shaman had gotten only 41 months in connection with the January 6th assault on the Capitol. With that, Crane asked for probation. No jail time. I'm, I'm not a lawyer. Don't give legal advice. So he presented a strategy that he thought made the most sense to get Hugo the best outcome. I think Hugo got the best outcome because of his PSR, his planning, his narrative, and his, and his statement. Either way, it's a team effort. We won because even though the range was 57 to 71, the government asked for 57. What happened? Well, after hearing from everyone, Judge Carney said, I'm going to oppose a custodial sentence of 36 months, three years. Mejia's mother, who was seated in the gallery, lowered her head. The room went silent. Paperni sat up on the edge of the bench, grabbing the back of the pew in front and strained to make direct eye contact with Mejia, who didn't forget. He leaned over and whispered to Crane, who asked if the judge would back Mejia's request for drug rehab. So I, I had to remind Hugo after sentencing to remind his lawyer of what had to happen next. So right after the number came in, Hugo and I, we kind of locked eyes and I said, you know what to do. And he did. From there... The lawyer asked, continuing, I will make a strong recommendation for that, he said cheerfully. Then Crane said he had another request. Mejia had asked him to be placed in a particular prison. My experience has been, I don't think the court is going to recommend a particular facility, he said very politely. But if the court is inclined to do so, we have a name in mind. I'll do it, Judge Carney said. It would be the Sheridan Federal Prison Camp that's in Oregon, Crane said. I'll make the recommendation, the judge said. Paperni clenched his fist behind the beach, beach bench and safe from judicial review, pumped the smallest bit of air. Those were wins. When you get the judge to recommend, when you get 36 months when the reins are 57 to 71, when you get a self-surrender, when you get the prison recommendation, when you got the RDAC re recommendation, those are win, 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 wins across the board. That's the value of mitigation and working. Within hours, many news outlets ran the story about a major financial criminal getting hard time. Fox Business, man gets three-year prison sentence for Bitcoin money laundering. But outside the courtroom, Paperni, full of pep, pulled Mejia aside and explained the math. The day you show up, you'll get five months off for good time. That's 31 months, he said. And you'll get nine months off for completing the drug program. That's 22. And you'll probably get seven or eight months in the halfway house, so it's 12 to 13 months. Throw in his health issues and the CARES Act if it applies, and Mejia might be home in less than a year. But Perny added that he had a few clients currently in Sheridan who would be there first thing, like a welcome wagon, and they were there to welcome him because Hugo went in on April 11. It took a while before Mejia brightened up and then grew chatty. He turned to me to marvel over this odd sense of relief he was feeling. Odd sense of relief he was feeling. Of clarity, he said. But Perny whipped out a selfie stick, and he and Mejia recorded a real-time video about what just happened to Mejia's sense of purpose. Michael Santos, who was not there, was very much there. After Paperni turned off his phone, Mejia's quick talk quickly shifted to his businesses, the future. He told his family he was going to make the businesses run while he's gone. He was in full planning mode. There was plenty of time before he had to report to prison for him to make it a turnkey situation for his employees. Down at the corner, a fresh set of bailiffs and clerks sipped their lattes. Just past the China's just past the Chinese elm trees, Mejia took his took his fiance's hand, and they walked away. So, wow, fifty three minutes. That's a big daddy. It's a long one. I'm very grateful that you let me read this article and offer some insights. I'm incredibly grateful to the New York Times, the New York Times Magazine, for following us for fourteen months or sixteen months, whatever. Following clients, listening on interviews, fact checking to the tenth degree. I'm so glad they did this. I'm so grateful that this is bringing more attention to our work and the way that we help people and also really addressing prison professors and the collateral consequences of mass incarceration that primarily affect people of color, people who are poor, people who have had parents in and out of the federal or state prison system their whole life. I'm so grateful that it's bringing attention to the way that really Michael and the nonprofit side of our business leads and creates content to ensure that people can release from prison with values and skills and this revolving door of, of mass incarceration, this revolving door of in and out of prison can stop once and for all. There's going to be the print edition of this article in the Times on Sunday and also the magazine, I believe. Uh, for now, thank you for listening and watching. 
And I'm very grateful for your attention and letting our team come into your home. Be well, be safe. Bye-bye.